Okay, it's, uh, the big clock is uh, close enough to quarter after that I guess we'll get started. Um, I guess this room has a good property that there isn't a class right before it, so people can slither in uh, peacefully. Um, let's start off. First of all, are there any logistical questions about uh, how many people successfully turned in the daily problem? How many people did not? And was there any, any uh, technical issues or glitches we have to worry about? Um, uh, OK, so I'm going to assume that's now under control, and we will do it. I noticed there were several questions about it during the, um, over Piazza. Piazza is a good place to send questions about that. And uh, you, know, you know, panic requests, um, like some people didn't have the book yet and wanted to know for sure what the problem was and stuff like that. That's a great use of the Piazza. Um, and uh, emailing me about the daily problems beforehand is a bad thing, because I, I, I go through the daily problems at the beginning of class for a reason. I want us to think about it and see the problems kind of you know, a little bit fresh. And so um, try, to, try to understand the daily problem. It's OK to bounce it off of people in uh, Piazza, but um, we will then discuss it here. OK, any questions? Any other logistical questions? OK, what I'd like to start by is uh, doing, like I will do after every class, what is the daily problem? And the daily problem, I believe, is this. OK, it is that the knapsack problem. The knapsack problem says that you're given a set of uh, integers and a target. And the goal is to find the subset of the integers which adds up to the target. Um, exactly to the target. Um, and uh, the, here's an example. Those set of numbers, those five numbers, apparently you can find <coughs> a subset that adds up to 22. Which subset of that adds up to 22? If we look at the example up there. OK. Does anyone have a, yeah? 1, 2, 9, and 10 is 22. But there's no subset that adds up exactly to 23, right? Can anybody think of why this is the, called the knapsack problem? OK, does this have any connection to knapsacks and stuff like that? You could think of the target as being a knapsack as a bag for carrying things. The, um, you could imagine a world where there are objects made of gold in a store. OK? You have a, you're trying to rob this store. OK? You have a knapsack, a, a bag that can hold up to T weight in gold. You want to find where can I, what are the objects I should pick that I can fit in the knapsack so I can carry it out, OK? And fills the knapsack, because I'm stealing it. The more I get, the better off I am. Any questions about that? So this is representative of all kinds of bin packing problems and things like that. And what I want you to do is to give counterexamples to the, um, the following algorithms. OK, and what does it mean by a counterexample? A counterexample, remember, is when an algorithm is wrong, that demonstrates that an algorithm is wrong. Um, now, you could imagine a world where there's no way to fill up the knapsack. If there's no way to fill up the knapsack, and your algorithm doesn't fill up the knapsack, is your algorithm wrong? No, I mean, there was no way. There's not, it's not the algorithm's problem. It's the problem instance's problem, right? Your algorithm is wrong if there is a way to fill the knapsack, and your algorithm doesn't find it. Is that clear with the people? OK, so what is the problem here? Let's see if I can do this. Bunk. OK, so the first um, thing is, I, given a set S, OK, and I'm going to fill the items into the knapsack <clears throat> from left to right order. And if it fits, I'm going to put it in. If it doesn't fit, I'm going to move on to the next item. And then uh, if I can't, uh, what you call it? If I can't fill the knapsack, OK, I give up and say it can't be done. What is a uh, counterexample? to this algorithm, this supposed algorithm, OK? Yes? What? Set of one, you want to say if I had to set one, two, 
3. And t is equal to what? t is equal to 5. Does everybody see that this looks reasonable? Okay. He's going to say if the target is 5, I'm going to go from left to right. I'm going to take the 1. I'm going to take the 2. And now I can't take the 3, right? Because there's only two, two units of room left in the knapsack. But there is a good solution here, 2 and, and uh, 3. Does everybody agree? Can anybody come up with a simpler counterexample? Again, a counterexample is really great when it is as simple as possible. Can anyone come up with a simpler counterexample? Yeah? Uh, it says 1, 2, and t equals 2. What if I said that t equals 2, and my answer was 1 and 2? It's the same idea as his example, right? That uh, once you pick the first thing, you're stuck. And you won't be able, there's only, you, know, you, you, you won't be able to fit in the solution, that, the element that really matters. Okay? So it's a good exercise to be able to simplify these as much as possible. Okay, what about the second one? Any questions about that? Okay. What about um, a, uh, what, um, if we put the items in the knapsack from smallest to biggest? Can anybody come up with a counterexample to that one? Somebody. Yeah? Same one works. Does everybody see? We put this thing in from smallest to biggest. Okay? And so this one also works to disprove the, the, that the best fit algorithm, putting them in from smallest to biggest, okay, is, uh, is going to work. What about if we put them in from biggest to smallest? Is there a counterexample to that? This time it doesn't work, notice. Notice that if I hide this one, if I put them in from biggest to smallest, I would stick the two in there and everyone would be happy, right? On this one over here, I would stick the three in and then the two in and it would be happy. So what's a counterexample to you? So what, what was the set? Okay, I'm not hearing this. So let's try one more time louder, or I'm going to make you come to the board. The same, oh, okay, well, okay, so you want to say, I think this same set, but where you replace t equals 1. Is that what you're saying? Is that going to be a counterexample? I'm going to say no. Why is that? What's going to be the algorithm? I try to stick 2 into the subset of knapsack of size 1. Can't do it. I move on to the next smaller element. And that one is of element 1, and that fits, and I'm done. Okay, do you see what I mean? If the procedure is you don't just pass out the moment you see the first item that uh, doesn't fit. Okay? That's not a counterexample. Can anybody come up with a counterexample? You. So you're saying that if the, um, what you call it, you want to say if your target is 4 is what I think I'm hearing. And you're saying it's 2, 2, 3? So what's going to happen? We're putting it in from largest. We're going to grab the uh, 3. Okay. When we grab the 3, we now have room for one more. And we can't fit, that one won't fit and that one won't fit. But there is, in fact, a solution here. Does everybody see that? Okay. So I, I, this one I do believe is a counterexample. There is a right answer here. But the heuristic where you go from, stick things in if they fit fails. Okay. It, make, it doesn't look at the global structure of this. Okay. And can't make the right decision. Any questions? Turns out that any heuristic like this is going to fail, because this is another one of these problems like the traveling salesman problem that is an NP-complete problem that there is no fast algorithm for. 
So if any of you, if I asked you guys, oh, do you have a fast algorithm? One of you might wave your hand, and I would say wrong, okay? Because I know that there is no fast algorithm for this problem, and you'll know why at the end of the semester. Any questions? Any questions about counterexamples? Any way we could make this one simpler? Does anyone want to say what, what's simpler about it? Some people might not like the fact that you duplicated things, right? I don't know if you, know, you can imagine that. Is there a way you can get away without having the same number? This meets specifications, but again, it's always good to see, is there another way? Is it the fact that you had duplicates that makes this problem hard? Or is there a way to have done this to change the number so there's not duplicates and the same thing happens? Yeah? What? Three, if, he's saying if this was three, four, and five, and what's my target going to be? Seven. Does everybody see that? That looks good, right? And is there any other way to make this thing simpler? These numbers are pretty big. Is there any way to make those numbers smaller? Would one, two, three, I guess one, two, three, three wouldn't work here, right? But uh, I guess, so, so, so I guess this, is, this, looks, this looks pretty good, okay? There may be some way you can change the numbers, but there's some cleverness here. Any questions about uh, the counterexample thing? Okay. Being able to find the counterexample is a very valuable thing. Let me just see if I can erase this way now. I have another way to erase that uh, maybe this isn't quite as horrible. It's just like on a whiteboard. Or maybe it is. Is it? It's still pretty bad. Okay, good. Let me now, um, what I'd like to do before I go on to the big O, I'd like to do one more of these algorithm design slash counterexample exercises, because this is the fun part of algorithm stuff, um, is when there is a, a, a problem, try to find me an algorithm, or you know, argue that uh, some heuristics you have don't work. A heuristic is usually a is what I would call a strategy that does something, but isn't always correct. What is the movie star scheduling problem? You could imagine you are the agent of a particular movie star. Maybe you work for Brad Pitt, maybe you work for Scarlett Johansson, who knows. They are, have the possibility of taking, a, 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 they are being offered a total of N jobs. Each job has a start date and an end date when they are needed for filming. And they are paid the same amount for each job. Okay, so their goal is to do the most number of jobs, make the most number of films that they can. But they can't be in two places, even if you are an Avenger, I guess. You can't be in two places at the same time. Okay, so what do we need? We need to have, find the largest subset of, time, of, of job intervals that don't intersect, that don't overlap. Okay, so let me make that clear from, the, from an example. Actually, hold on. Actually, wait, do I have a, here it is. Here's an example. Let's say you're, you're Scarlett Johansson, you're offered, the, these are the jobs, you can, the films that you're being pitched. The x-axis is time, right? A certain number of months ahead from now, okay? What is the set of jobs you can take, the, most jo the, the, the largest number of films you can make? without uh, getting, you know, doing two at the same time. Does anybody have a proposed solution for this example? What should somebody take? May what movies should the agent sign for? Anyone? Yes. You think they can, you can get away with four movies. Which four? Discrete math, okay. Halting state, programming challenges, that's probably an adventure film, and K3. 
calculated bets. Does everybody see that they can do those four jobs? Okay. But they can't. Uh, is there any other way they could have done four jobs? Yeah? Steiner's tree, okay. So they could have done Steiner's tree instead of halting state. Okay? But the claim is, and I think I believe it, that there's no way they can do more than four of these films. Does everybody agree? Okay, how do we find, now my question for you is, you guys are algorithm designers, what algorithm should the um, agent use in order to maximize the number of, of films that their star can get paid for? Does anyone have a proposal? Yes? Okay, what you might have said, okay, and I'm not sure if I hear these right, okay, you know, I have, uh, is you start with the first job. You're saying, look, the star is not doing anything. Might as well get the job star. Why don't we start the guy on the first job, okay? Then when that's done, you want to keep this guy busy. What's the next job? This one, I think, goes up to here, right? So I think he can't do both halting state and uh, the algorithm job, right? Find the next job that starts, that hasn't yet, doesn't overlap what we're doing. Find the next one that o doesn't start, that overlaps what we're doing. Next one that doesn't start, that overlaps what we're doing. I think that in this case, the guy could do this algorithm will give all four jobs for this one. Does everybody understand the idea? Earliest job. In this case, it does the right thing, right? It's a different set of movies than we talked about before. True or false, does the first job, earliest job heuristic, maximize the number of movies? You either need to give me an argument why it's right, or you've got to give me a counterexample, yeah? Right, okay, so the way I was thinking, what happens if, okay, someone is pitching, let me see if I can get this right. Um, okay, hold on, am I right or am I in, okay, am I now, okay, let's stay focused. This thing is, oh, okay, wait a second, boom. The earliest job first, this is what I think your heuristic is. Start from the earliest job and keep going. What is the counterexample? What if the first movie is War and Peace? Okay? That might be a humongous film, a big epic. Okay? They might win an Academy Award for it, but they can't do those five beer commercials that would pay just as much money. Right? So does everybody agree earliest job first does not do the job of maximizing the number of, say, of things? Any other ideas, yeah? I need a loud ideas, because... Okay, so you're trying to give me another counterexample to this idea, okay? So you're saying we got lucky on the previous example that Steiner's tree happened to be there. Okay, and that's probably true. Whenever a heuristic works, you get lucky, unless it's a provably correct one. Now, give me another algorithm. Does anybody else have an idea? Yeah. Okay, the second thing that everybody always thinks about is if they're paying me for the same amount for every movie, I want to work on the smallest, mo shortest movie possible. That way I'm going to prevent myself from having any other, you know, the smaller amount I work on this, not only is it good I get to rest, but I'm available to take, you know, more times to take other jobs. Okay? So what's the shortest job? Take the shortest possible job, then remove all the movies that intersect that, and then keep repeating until I'm out of movies. Does this do the right thing? Or can someone find me a counterexample to this? 
When would it be bad to take shortest, the shortest job? Yes, you in the pink. Two long movies. If I had two long movies that were blocked, I couldn't take both of them. If I took the short movie, then that's the kind of problem that I might have. What would I do? What if we have a world where there are two long movies and one short movie that overlaps both of them? Okay, if I take the short movie, I get one. If I take the two long movies, I get two, right? So picking the shortest job can't do this, okay? Is there any algorithm that will do this? Or is, this, or is everything in the world hopeless in this class? Yeah? Okay, I could try all possible subsets of jobs, ask if they intersect each, if, if test if they don't intersect, and then see if it's the biggest one I had so far. That would indeed be a correct algorithm. What would the running time be if I have n such things? How many subsets of n things do I have to try? How many subsets of n things are there? Does anyone know? Yeah? Two to the n, right? I mean, how many subsets are there, if I go back and deal with out of the items one, two, three? What are they? Well, there's the empty set. There is one, two, three, one, two, two, three, one, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two to the three is eight. Okay? So you're right, I could try all possible subsets, but two to the n is exponential. This is bad news, I don't wanna do that. Is there a faster rule that does it in the back? Okay, end, earliest end date. This is kind of a surprise. What if I say, take the job with the earliest completion date? Okay, so let's go back maybe to my original, uh, what you call it, uh, my original movie here. I guess I'm sorry if I, oh, boom. Which is the movie that ends, the, that ends first? The first one to end is discrete mathematics. Does everybody see that? Now I kill the job movies that uh, overlap it. What is the next one that ends? Okay, someone, okay, obviously the algorithm intersects it, that I can't take that. Tarjan of the jungle intersects what I have, I can't take that. What's the next first one to end? Yeah? Halting. Halting state, right? Once I take that, Steiner's tree is no good. What's the next one that, uh, that ends qu first? You can yell it out, programming challenges, and then everybody else intersects it, it's calculated bets. That one did yield the right solution. Does the, why does the first one to end give it, does that, does that work on all examples? You give me a counterexample, I believe it doesn't. If not, you need to give me a proof of correctness, right? What is the argument that first job to end is correct? Does anybody have a feeling? Okay. Why is this an interesting idea? Notice, I guess, that the first job to end, if I do that, I had a choice of taking this or the movies that intersect me, right? Now, would I be better off with any of the movies that intersect me? The answer, if I take any of the movies that intersected me, they go on past my end, because I'm the first one to end. Does everybody see that? So if you take me, you might be, instead of taking um, the other ones that intersect me, there is a, ch a, a chance you will be able to have jobs that you would not have been able to take. 
that the other ones could. Does everybody kind of see that logic? What, what if I didn't take any of them? Could that be the optimum solution? Well, if you took all the ones that intersected the first job to end and you didn't take any of them, whatever solution you have, you could have added discrete math to it and the solution would have gotten bigger. Okay? So there is actually a proof or an argument as to why this heuristic does what it should do. Any questions about that? Let me get to the right slide just to see if we're... Okay, something bad has happened. What is the proof? Other jobs might have started before from left to right, the first job to complete. But all of them must intersect X, and all of them must intersect each other. You can select at most one from that, that group. If you select the first one to complete, it potentially blocks out fewer things. It blocks out fewer things than any of the other jobs. Okay, so you can't go wrong picking it. And if you don't pick any of these, well, you just shortchanged yourself because you could always add this to any solution that didn't contain any of them, and it would get bigger. Any questions? Does everybody see that that is a correct algorithm? Okay, and it's not exhaustive search. It's not any slower than any of the other procedures. It just requires a little bit more thinking. Any questions? Any questions on movie star scheduling? Okay. So correctness is an important thing. And um, for certain proofs, certain problems, I'll say that algorithms of correctness is relatively obvious, but sometimes it isn't. And th that requires a proof. Okay. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, fair enough. Let's try this. Let me try. Boom. Okay. Any questions about uh, counterexamples or any of that? Going once, twice, three times. Okay. What I'd like to now talk about is time complexity. Okay. The, you know that uh, we talk about algorithms being efficient or not. I think from our discussion so far, you guys were convinced that searching through all subsets would be 2 to the n, and that's bad news. What was the complexity? How much time did the pick the first one to end take? We didn't talk about that. We, have, we don't really yet have a language for talking about how fast it is. I think you'll believe that you could, for large numbers of instances, you could do the first job to end, you could do by hand in your head. And while trying all subsets, forget about it, okay? But we need a, a, a more rigorous way to talk about what the time complexity of an algorithm is. And this is what gets us into the RAM model of computation and to the big O notation. So what is the RAM accent model of computation? It's something that we will call, it's kind of a theoretical model of what computers do. What are computers do? Computers in my uh, world have the property that, uh, that every simple operation, be it a plus, adding two numbers, subtracting two numbers, multiplying two numbers, dividing two numbers, incrementing a counter, testing is this equal to that, all elementary operations take one step. Okay, perhaps we'll call the step a computron. That's the smallest unit of computation in the universe, is a computron. And this I'm making up, so you don't have to write that in the notes. But think about it. We're talking about describing the running time of algorithms by how many steps they take. And we're going to assume that every simple instruction takes one step. A loop is not a simple instruction. A loop goes around a certain number of times. For i goes from 1 to 10 is different than for i goes from 1 to a billion. One used a hun 10 computrons, one used a, hundred compu a billion computrons. Okay? 
So um, we're not, loops get counted by how many times they go around. And subroutines, I guess the call of the subroutine takes one step. But you have to execute the subroutine. What gets done in the, in the subroutine counts as work, right? You can't make your program faster by sticking the middle part in a subroutine and calling that subroutine. The work is still done, right? So these do not count as single step operations. Sort in numbers is not a single step operation. It's calling an al a procedure that's going and doing a lot of steps. Any questions? The other thing about a, a RAM machine is that every memory access takes only one step. To fetch something from memory takes one computron. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, is this an accurate model? And then we're going to say how much the running time for an, a given algorithm? The, algor the running time of an algorithm on a particular example, particular instance, is going to be a count of how many steps were done. Any questions? Now, if your, step, if your computer does a billion instructions a second, you, maybe you could convert between number of steps and number of seconds, okay? But we're going to be interested in here in counting steps. Any questions? Now, are these assumptions justified? Let's start with this thing. Is it true that every, every individual operation on your computer takes the same number of steps? No. What the two operations on a, elementary operations on a computer that do not take the same amount of time? Does anyone have an example? Yeah? Multiplying generally will take more than adding, right? Okay. So I would say by that definition, your real computer isn't quite right, you know, doesn't satisfy that. I think the second thing is just bookkeeping. Is it true that on every, a modern computer, does every data access take the same amount of time? Or do, why not? Uh, somebody else who has a computer. Any of you guys got a computer someplace else in the room? Okay. Yeah, you. There's this notion of cache memory. Remember, have you guys taken, uh, 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 like, I guess, 220, probably the data, you know, computer organization? You'll know that a modern computer, there are registers, and there's caches, and there's main memory, and then there's disks, and then there's all very complicated. But we're going to say that every one of these steps takes one time. Now, this isn't a completely, so therefore this RAM model is not a perfect model of what's going on in a computer, but it is a very, very useful model of a compute, what goes on in a computer. You like to think, you know, it's good when you can simplify your way of thinking about things and not getting caught in irrelevant details, okay? And as an example that I'd like to think motivates that, who here believes the earth is flat? I see one who here believes it's not flat. Let's just see if we get a majority. Okay, a few more twitches. Who here is still on the fence one way or another? Okay, a bunch. Okay. Well, the world is not flat, okay? But we think about the world being flat a lot, okay? When you buy, a, buy shoes, do you look to see if your shoes have been cut so that, you know, that the surface really grips the surface of a sphere? Right? Do you kind of get this idea? If the if this Earth is really a sphere on a level that you care about, you want the bottom of your shoe to sort of carve out a certain arc of an angle. Right? But you don't, and the people who make shoes don't, because they assume that the world is flat. Okay? And for a lot of different things, the, the flat Earth model is very, very useful. And likewise, for trying to analyze whether one algorithm is better than another, to a large extent, counting steps the way I did is very, very useful. Any question?
You know, it, it cl clears the head to not worry about certain things, and that's an important thing. Any questions? Okay. Now then, okay, we now know that for any given algorithm, on any given input, it should be clear that you could simulate what that algorithm would do and count how many steps it takes, right? You know, if you were walking through, you guys have debugged programs by trying to go and look down and see what every step of the program does and, and stuff like that. So what is the worst case complexity of an algorithm? Well, we could take for any, any algorithm in the universe, we could build a graph where the x-axis is the size of the problem, the number of ele data elements. Okay? For sorting, maybe you're going to sort one element, two elements, three elements, dot, dot, dot. For any particular algorithm, on any, on, on, you know, you could now take a look and say for all possible inputs of a given size, what's the number of steps it takes on that input? Okay? It should be clear this is a well-defined thing. In sorting, how many sorting examples are there? Possible sorting examples that are interesting on four elements. Does anybody know? Well, sorting is a process of rearranging the order of things. A, B, C, D, E. Does everybody see that A, B, C, D, E and 1, 2, 3, 4 are just as hard to sort? Right? There are four elements. You're just going to do comparisons between them. There are n factorial different arrangements of the input. It's quite possible that D, C, B, A might take more steps than A, B, C, D. Does everybody agree with that? Depending upon your algorithm. This is a graph where the x-axis is the size of the problem. The y-axis is how many steps does that algorithm take on a particular example? And each dot here represents a possible input. Okay? A possible complete input. Not part of an input, but a complete input. Right? And so if you look at it, any algorithm kind of defines these set of columns. Okay? Where n is the size of the problem, and y is the number of steps, and there's a dot for every instance. If you've got that, then we can talk about what the worst case time complexity, the best case, and the average case is. The worst case time complexity is if we drew a curve that passed through the points for any given n, what was the number of steps where y was biggest? Okay? The best case complexity was, for all the instances of size n, what was the one that took the fewest steps? Okay? And the average, well, if we averaged all the numbers in a particular column, we would get an average running time. Does everybody see that this way of dealing with it, any algorithm for any problem, yields a picture like this? And... Um, these curves of what the best case, worst case, and average case are. Any questions? Yes? You're saying, is there a correlation between what? Okay. So you're telling me, if I wanted to guess this by doing experiments, how many, if I don't construct all the examples, but I maybe construct examples at random, maybe I could get an idea what this is by experiment. Okay? But we don't want to do experiments in here. This is a thinking class. Okay? 
We would like to be able to find what is the worst case number of steps by using brain power and not computing power. This is the picture inherent in any algorithm. If you did it experimentally, it would look like this, but not all the dots would be there because you didn't try all possible examples. Okay? But we want to know, be able to look at an algorithm and figure this out. Okay? So the important thing is that best case, worst case, and average case are functions that where time is a function of size of the input. That's the important thing. Any questions about that? So far, people buy it. May not be happy about it, but they buy it. Now, which is more important when you talk about an algorithm? Let's say we want to think about an algorithm like this. Which do we think will tell us the most, that it, most information about our algorithm that we care about? Do we want to know about the best case, the worst case, or the average case? Yeah? You say worst case. Why do you want to know the worst case? So the worst case is good if you are unlucky, okay, is one way to look at this. If you wanted to run this algorithm between breaths of a heart-lung machine, you would not like to have an algorithm run a long time and the guy doesn't breathe, right? So if you believe that, worst case is more informative. But I bet you you don't believe that. Is there somebody else who thinks one of these other ones is more informative? A lot of people, at least when they first think about it, is think average case sounds really good. You know, if you're thinking about the absolute worst thing that can happen to you, sometimes you are being too pessimistic about life. What is the worst thing that can happen if you take this class? You can fail, right? Is that the thing that's most like that? that, is that is, does that mean you should all drop the class now? Because you, the answer is no. Okay, yeah. Say that again, I'm sorry. So I want to ask, why does the number of steps go down as the power size increases for the power size case? Okay, you're saying, why is it that you're saying you're suspicious about this picture? Because you're saying, why could there be a, uh, a case that it took less time for n equals 4 than it took a, a something of size 2? Okay, is that possible? Well, suppose the algorithm started out by saying, count the number of elements. If, if it has four elements, print the answer. If it has two elements, wait 10 minutes just to frustrate this guy. Does everybody see that? You could have an algorithm like that. I'm not, you know, it depends what it is. Usually your intuition would be that it's right, that the complexity of this should probably increase with n or stay the same. Right? But also notice that there are weird effects. For example, how many of you know, you know about binary search, right? Now, binary search splits, you look at the middle element and you split it to the other halves. It turns out that actually if you have a number n that's 2 to the n, exactly something like 2 to the n minus 1, that will actually perform much better than something like 2 to the n minus 2. Just not much better, a tiny, tiny bit better. Because it's always splitting it perfectly in half and as opposed to not splitting it perfectly in half. There are weird low-level things that can happen. We are not interested in weird lower-level things, though. And that's why we're going to get into the big O notation to solve this exact problem. Okay, that when you look at these algorithm complexities very, very carefully, okay, yeah, well, when you look at these algorithm complexities very, very carefully, okay, they're going to look weird up and down and a little bit of noise and very complicated and they're horrible to work out exactly. 
The reason we're going to use the big O notation is we're going to find that it's very easy to come up with simple, it's relatively easy, to come up with relatively simple upper bounds and lower bounds on the complexity function that are much easier to work with than the exact value that don't have these weirdnesses of bouncing around, right? And that's why we're going to deal with the big O. Because the exact, exact weirdnesses of these counting functions is hard. But if we talk about simple upper and lower bounds, they are going to be smooth and they're going to be nice. Okay, any questions? Okay, let me, before I get into that, and I do want to get into that, I want to go back one last time to say what is our complex position on complexity analysis. As far as taking this class, the worst case thing being failure, that's the wrong way to think about this class. But in a lot of things, it's not the wrong way to think about it. When you buy a lottery ticket, what's going to happen when you buy a lottery ticket? I saw the Powerball's 300 million now. What happens if you buy a, a lottery ticket? The answer is nothing happens. You lose, right? That's the worst case. And that's going to happen to also be essentially what the average case is. Worrying about the best case on the lottery is distracting if you're really trying to get any sense of what's going on, right? Worrying about what is the average case in a, a lottery ticket is a pretty complicated computation. Saying that you just lose, okay, and rip up the ticket before you even wait for the lottery, you do almost as well as in the average case, okay? And um, in this class, worst case analysis of algorithms has the property that it's relatively easy to do, okay? And um, it usually gives a good idea about what the average case is. So almost all the time in this class, and especially if I never say anything, we're going to be assuming you're doing a worst case analysis. Any questions? There are a few points in the class where we're going to talk about randomized algorithms, where the algorithm flips coins to help make decisions about what to do. And usually what happens is if you do a randomized algorithm, it kind of behaves like it's sort of like what the average case is. It's a little subtle what the difference is. Okay? So when I talk about randomized algorithms, I'll talk about randomized, you know, uh, you know what, what's the expected running time. But in general, we're going to be here be interested in worst case running time. Any questions? Okay, good. That said, the language we're going to use for talking about the worst case running time of algorithms is the big O notation. What was the motivation? The motivation was, like I said, exact running time analysis for any given algorithm. The worst case is tricky to do exactly right. The function is going to have ups and downs and is weird. What are we going to want? It's going to suffice to talk about, can we come up with a simple upper bound and a simple lower bound as to what the real com worst case complexity is? And we're not going to care about tiny things like whether or not, it, how it performed with two elements or three elements. We are interested in how does it perform with n elements. And we want to guarantee that once we get past a certain point for a big enough value of n, from then on the blue line curve is an upper bound on the worst case complexity. That means that we can talk about the worst case as being the blue bound. Or if we talk about the red case, that at, at past a certain point, the red line is a lower bound. Okay. We can talk about that. We're not going to worry about small n. We want to worry about big n. Any questions? And that's what motivates us to talk about the big O notation. Um, let me see. Is this right? Hold on. OK. When we talk about the big O, the big theta, and the big omega function, 
We're going to be talking about as, as tight as we can practically deal with the time complexity functions. Any questions? Okay. So what is this? What does it mean when we say that gn, a function gn, is big O of f of n? Okay? That means that there's some constant times f of n that is an upper bound. Okay? The big O is how we talk about upper bounds. Okay? G of n is omega of f of n means that a constant times this is a lower bound on g of n. Some way to think about it, what does the first one mean? It means that basically g of n is less than or equal to c f of n. And I'm afraid I'm going to mess, that's not so written so well. Okay, this is what the, uh, this is bad, hold on. Okay. So this is what the big O means. That if G of N is big O of F of N, it means that G N is less than C times F of N. That means that F of N is an upper bound. If we have, on the other hand, a less than or equal to, if C times F of N is less than G of N, then we've got a lower bound, and um, that's the uh, omega thing. G of n is theta of, G of f of n. It means that c times fn is an upper bound. c1 times fn is an upper bound, and c2 times f of n is a lower bound. That means that f of n and g of n are really about the same thing. Does everybody kind of see that? If I know that, um, what do I know? If I know that, uh, just to use the same next, if I know that g of n is less than or equal to 3 times um, f of n, and I know that g of n is greater than or equal to 1 times f of n, I have a pretty good idea of what g of n is, right? Let's say that f of n was equal to n squared. What do I know? Here is the curve. Um, this is the curve n squared. This is the curve 3 times n squared. Suppose my g of n did things like this. Little loop to loop, but it's staying in there. What do I know? If I know this is true, I would know that g of n is equal to theta of n squared. And once I got a big enough number, for all n greater than this n naught, I would know that I've got f, uh, g of n is between, is basically upper bounded and lower bounded by n squared. It means it's theta of n squared. Any questions? Yes? Theta means that I've got no both. It's a question, what do I know? Okay? I'm going to, you know, again, I shouldn't talk about money, right? But I'm going to let you know something. I have less than $3 billion. Okay? Is that true? You bet it's true. I'm sad to say it's true, but it's true. Right? Is it informative? Somewhat. Okay? But you still don't know how bad it is, what I have, right? If I told you I have, I happen to have greater than or equal to $10 and less than three, 3 billion, okay? You now have upper and lower bounds. You know more, right? 
To really say you know about a function, you want to have upper and lower bounds, and you want them to be ideally close to each other. If they are essentially the same thing, as close as possible, that is what the theta is. Right? Any questions? Okay, let's keep going on this. Okay, sorry. Uh, let me try to erase this. So when I think about what the big O means and the big theta and all these kind of things, I always draw pictures because everything should be, look at the definitions and look at the pictures. What does the big O mean? This is the big O, okay? What does it mean? We would say that um, f of n here, this is saying that f of n is big O of g of n. Why? This picture shows because once we get past a certain point, g of n is bigger than f of n. In this figure, there is a constant here and a starting point beyond which, okay, g of n is always less than f of n. And here is the theta case. We have two constants, one of which times g of n gives me an upper bound, one of them that is a constant gives me a lower bound. Okay? And if, there, if, if g of n is both an upper bound and a lower bound, it's a tight bound. And that's what we like. Any questions? Okay. Let's go. So I think the pictures are important to look at. What are the definitions? When I do these things, sorry, I haven't figured this out yet. When I look at these things, when I think about these problems, they sometimes get tricky. I always go back to the definition. What does it mean when f of n is big O of g of n? It means that there must be constants n0 and c, such that for all n greater than n naught, okay, f of n is always less than or equal to c times gn, okay? For the uh, omega bound, Okay, they've got to be an n naught and a c, such that for all n greater than n naught, f of n is always greater than or equal to c times gn. And for the last one, to be a theta bound, it means you've got to have the n naught bound, so beyond a certain point, c1 and two, c2 are coefficients that have the property that C1 GN is always bigger than F of N, and C2 GN is always less than. Any questions? Okay, let's see what this means now. Let's look at some uh, examples. But any questions about the definitions? Whenever I want to think about these things, I go back to the definition, because sometimes these things get tricky. If you follow the definition, Everything works out fine. Okay, so what is the example here? Sorry. Uh-oh, uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. Now I can tell I blew it. Okay, hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Boom. Let's look at some examples. Okay. Suppose I have that f of n is equal to this. This is what f of n is. It's 3n squared minus 100n plus 6. Is f of n big O of n squared? Okay. See some people nodding. But what does it mean? It, this thing, f of n... And I, is going to be equal to big O of n squared if there is some constant 
times n squared, such that this is always bigger, uh-oh, trouble, bigger than f of n. What constant could we multiply n squared to to make it bigger than 3n squared minus 6? 3n three, three squared minus 100n plus 6. What constant could we multiply n squared by to make it bigger than that? Yeah? What was it? 3? Three? 3 will make it bigger eventually. Okay? Notice if I do set it equal to 3, 3n three squared, 3n three squared, this is kind of a funny function in that uh, the, the 100n is negative and 6, right? So as n gets bigger and bigger, this part is going to get smaller and smaller, right? And so, yeah, if I, if I use 3, that would work. What if I used 4? Let's think about boldly. Is 4n squared bigger than f of n? What about 5n squared? Yeah? For us to make this argument, we could use any constant that we want. We don't get points for using the smallest one, right? It should be clear that for any coefficient greater than 3, okay, the right side is eventually Okay, going to be bigger than for some large n. Notice there could be some weirdnesses. What if it was 3n? Let's make it a uh, plus 6 billion. Okay. Now f of n looks bigger, right? It's now got 3n squared plus 6 billion. Is 4n always n squared always going to be bigger than f of n? Not for very, very small n. Does everybody see that? But by the time we get to n equals 3 billion, 4n squared is going to be bigger than 3n squared plus 3 billion. Does everybody kind of see that? So yes, it is a big O is legal because we could find an, a coefficient that once we get beyond the point, okay, this is going to always work. Any questions? What about n cubed? Let me now try it the other way. Is there some constant times n cubed that I could make such that n cubed times uh, c is bigger than this? Can anyone give me a co coefficient where that property is going to be true? What constant can I multiply n cubed by to make it bigger than this thing on the right? Yeah? 500. 500? That sounds like a good one. What if, but, but what if I gave it, well, why 500? Oh. What? Just a random number. Just a random number. What number wouldn't work? Zero. Well, zero won't work, right? Okay. Negative number wouldn't work, right? But on the other hand, if I have, let's take a look at it. Suppose I have multiplied by 0 0.01. For what value of n does 0, 0.0, okay, times n cubed beat n? Let's, just, let's get rid of the 3 just for simplification. Now, okay, again, I'm sorry. My, my pen does not line up quite right. What if I had 0, 0.0, let's just make it like this. Suppose I had point zero one n cubed. How does that compare to um, what you call it? If I want to say this, if I have n squared, for what value of n does point zero one n cubed start to beat n squared? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah? 100. This can be written as 0 0.01 times n times n squared. So long as this is greater than 1, this side will be bigger than that, right? And so for n equals 100, 
suddenly this side will be bigger than that, right? If this was 0 .00 like that, now it would be one out of n would be a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, a million. But whatever about how efficient I put here, eventually n will be big enough that beyond it, this is bigger than that. And so yes, this function is big O of n squared n cubed. Does everybody agree? You should agree with this now, or you should agree with that. Any questions about that? Okay. What about the last one? Is there any coefficient c times n such that this is going to be bigger than n squared? Let's think about that. n is a variable, c is a coefficient. Is there any value of C such that this expression is always going to be true? Okay, I see people shaking no, but what if C was equal to billion? Okay, what if I have a really big number? What if I had 10 to the 10th? Ha ha, that's a big number, right? But what's going to happen if I multiply this by N? The moment n is equal to 10 to the 10th, what's going to happen? This side is going to be equal to that side. And then once we get to n plus 1, 10 to the 10th plus 1, this side is bigger. There is no constant here that you can multiply this by to make it bigger. So this is not, okay, big O of that. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Let's try and, uh, any questions about the big O? Okay. What about the omega? The omega, remember, was we wanted to have a constant C, such as C times n squared, was less than f of n. Is there any constant times n squared such that it's going to be less than 3n squared? What would be a value of c where this is going to be true? Okay. You see what my f of n is? This is my f of n. Okay, what would be a value of C such that the right side is going to be smaller than the left side? Yeah? Any constant that's less than 3, if I use 2.99, eventually the 3n squared is going to get bigger than this thing. In this case, if it has to overcome the 6. If I, even if I had a plus, eventually, th for some value of n, 3n squared is going to be bigger than 2.99n squared plus lower order terms. Okay? So there'll be a break-even point. Beyond that, it goes. So, so long as my coefficient here was less than this, this is going to be, have the big omega property. Any questions? What about n squared? Is there any, oh God, sorry about that. Is there any value of c times n, squ n cubed that it's always going to be less than n squared? 3n squared. No. Whatever value of c you pick, okay? Okay, even if c is very, very, very small, you separate that n cubed into n times n, n squared, by the time that n is equal to 1 over c, okay, there's going to be a tie, and then it's going to take off from there. Any questions about that? Okay, 
So that's an important. That's important. So it is not okay. Um, big o omega of n cubed. What about n? N is n a lower bound? Let me now erase this. Is there some constant times n such that that's less than three n squared? And it should be pretty clear on one side of the expression. You've got 3n squared plus some little change. On the other side, we've got a c times n. If we cancel the n, OK, it should be clear that on this side, we've got 3n. On this time, we've got a constant. OK, it should be clear that for large enough n, OK, this is going to eventually have to beat that, no matter how big the C is. Any questions? So this has the big omega. This has the big omega. This has not got the big omega. Any questions? Yes? Sorry, can the constant be zero? What? The, can a constant be zero? The answer is no. Weird things happen with a constant being zero. That defeats the whole purpose of it. OK? So the constant has to be greater than 0. OK? But that leaves you a lot of room here. OK? And finally, what do we have about, I think it's finally. Let's just take a look. We have the omega, the theta. What is the theta story? If you remember back to the previous one, 3n squared minus 100n plus 6 was theta of n squared, because for that one it was both big O and big omega. For n cubed, there was only the big omega relationship. And for n, there was only the, no, oh, oh, it was only the big O relationship for n cubed and the big omega relationship for n. So why is that? The reason is because it's pretty obvious. On this side, n squared is the biggest of these functions. That's the part that's going to grow fastest, right? And, uh, you know, um, the bound here is the part that is growing fastest, OK? So rather than deal with a complicated function like that, we could deal with the um, n squared. And that's a theta bound. That means that we have a tight idea of what the complexity of that thing is. Any questions? OK, any questions about the big O based on this? OK. There are a few things to see here. First, notice that the big O is a function, a, a notation for talking about functions. It has absolutely nothing to do with I intrinsically about algorithms. You could imagine if you are, um, what you call it, uh, Jeff Bezos. Here is your dollars as a function of time. What was Jeff Bezos' dollars as a function of time? When he was a kid, he would maybe rob a dime from his brother or something like that. Then he started founding Microsoft, uh, Amazon. And then maybe he got into trouble with his wife. And it went, they went down. <laughs> OK, and then it kept going up. Does everybody see that, um, what you call it? The Bezos money as a function of time is a function. You can talk about what is his complexity of getting, money, getting richer. I can tell you it's probably cr exponential. Actually, the same reason why you don't pay your credit card. OK, that's going to be growing exponentially, too. OK, but it should be clear that any function of uh, something over time, it's going to have ups and downs. What's the important part of Jeff Bezos' thing? It's not the fact that he worked as a paper boy. It's not the fact that he had, um, what you call it, uh, marital difficulties. What's important is that there is, from a certain point, an upper bound and a lower bound on it. He doubles his money every year, let's say. Okay? If so, 
he presumably makes his money grows like two to the n. Okay, the big O gives you a notation for talking about functions, how they grow as n gets larger. Any questions about that? So we're going to be using that here to talk about algorithm complexity. Okay, but understand that it's a function, it's a complexity that works on any numerical function, it's just a language for talking about things. And the fun langu function that we care most about in the universe is what is the worst case running time of a particular algorithm. Any questions? Okay. Any questions? Okay. If not, at this point, I'm going to say that's good enough for today. But do the daily problem, and I will see you people on Tuesday. Okay? Thanks a lot. Yes. Okay, hold on a second. What? I may have a solution to your eraser. What is it? What? If you, I, if you hold the eraser, like make a circle around what you want to erase and then tap in the center. Okay, tell you what. Next class, maybe you're right, okay? <laughs> Next class, come to me before the beginning of class when you see me milling around. Okay. And we'll do an experiment. Okay. Hi there. Okay. Oh, okay. For you, just so you're going to see, can you log on this machine? Prove to me you can log on this machine. I'm all, no, no, no. Just, just go. See if you can log in. This is usually where it is. So this is usually how I, oh, let me take this off, hold on.